Hear our prayers. Um, please pray for uh, the FM high school community and the family of the young lady, who, uh, junior, who passed away this week. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Continue prayers for the victims of gun violence that's going on in this country. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Um, prayers for Ron, please. The he will start eating again. Mm. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. I'll invite you to take a moment to pray silently on your own, and then I'll lead us in prayer together. Almighty and ever-present God, you are more than this universe can contain, and yet you love us as individuals and draw close to us. We praise you, God. We praise you for your splendor, for your grandeur, we praise you for your attentiveness and your nearness. And we confess, Lord, that far too often we fail to recognize your presence in our lives. Far too often we take you for granted. We forget how big, how powerful you really are. Forgive us, Lord, and open our eyes. Help us to see more clearly all those ways you are with us. Help us to see more clearly your power, your glory, your ability to be at work in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Help us, Lord, to recognize you for who you are, to be moved by it, to be shaped by it and to better reflect that image to the world around us. And God, we thank you for all those ways that you have helped us to see you at work in our lives and the lives of people around us. We thank you for those moments when you've protected us, when you've kept us safe from injury, from harm, when you've kept the injuries that we did sustain much better than they could have been. We thank you, God, for the healing that we've experienced, even if it's only partly done. We thank you, God, for drawing near to us to comfort us and uphold us in times of mourning, in times of great trial. And God, we thank you for all those times you've been at work and our eyes were so focused on the problem that we didn't even see you. Help us to recognize those things after the fact. Help us to take moments of introspection so that we can appreciate what you are doing and what you have done. And we thank you, God, for this great gift of prayer, for this invitation to, to come to you with all the things that weigh on our hearts, to lift them up, to turn them over to you, 
to have other people come alongside us and join us in prayer. And we do lift up all these concerns, all these things weighing on our hearts, God. We ask you to continue to be at work as only you can. God, for all those who are sick this morning, all those who are recovering from injuries, from procedures of different kinds, all those who are waiting on news, we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to be at work, and that you would bring healing and wholeness, restoration to their bodies, that you would relieve pain, that you would lessen the psychological impact and bring comfort. We lift up those around them who are caring for them and ask for strength, for endurance, and for comfort. God, we lift up all those who are living under the threat of violence around our world, in our own nation, all those who are dealing with the fallout, the consequences of recent violence. We ask that you would protect, that you would guide, and that you would bring peace. God, we lift up all those who are hurting, all those whose needs are less obvious, all those whose hearts are hungry and whose souls are weak. Meet their needs, God. Give them the spiritual provision that they need. Reveal yourself to them in new ways and draw them to you. And Lord, in all these things we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Guide us and show us how we can be participants in the work that you're doing. Open our eyes to the opportunities that we have to show your love and your grace. The opportunities that we have to participate in your presence in their lives, to strengthen and encourage, to provide for and protect. Use us, Lord, and let us experience a new fellowship with you as we work alongside you in this way. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And we ask all of these things in the beautiful and powerful name of our risen Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> this week, we continue our sermon series on Jesus' life. As the time drew nearer for his triumphant entry and eventual crucifixion, his ministry shifted from the northern region of Galilee down to Judea, the region around Jerusalem. On one of his trips into Jerusalem, before the palm branches, he was explaining to some Jewish listeners how they had been made slaves by sin, but he could set them free. They objected to this message, and Jesus told them that they could not believe him because they believed the devil's lies. Listen now to how the rest of the conversation went in John chapter 8, verses 48 through 59. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. 
Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me. He of whom you say, he is our God, though you do not know him. But I know him, and if I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your an ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Corey, I'm going to kind of walk through these verses a bit, so if it's not too much, could you try to um, back up and go through the verses as I do them? I'm sorry, I should have warned you about that before we started. If anything goes wrong with the slides, just know that this is my fault, not Corey's, because I, this is the first she's hearing about this right now. So uh, this is quite the conversation <laughs> that Jesus is having with these Jewish listeners, uh, it begins, if you back up a little bit, we, I didn't want to do the whole reading because it's so long, but it begins with an argument. I mean, it starts off with less of an argument, but Jesus is making this bold claim. You're, you're slaves and I can set you free. And these Jewish listeners are saying, we've never been slaves. What are you talking about? And Jesus says, well, you're, you've become slaves to sin. You've made yourselves slaves to sin, but I can set you free from that. And they're kind of like, who are you to think one, that we're slaves, and two, that you have the ability to set us free. And that's kind of the crux of, of this argument that's going on, and we kind of join it in process. Jesus' responses have slowly grown sort of more and more challenging. Um, you could even say more and more harsh, although I don't, like to, I don't like to use words that might be interpreted as painting Jesus in a bad light, but he's certainly becoming more challenging with his responses. And that prompts these Jewish leaders in, in verse 48 to say, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Now, you know a conversation's going well when the person you're talking to asks if you're demon-possessed. <laughs> and it, in the, it's important that we recognize, too, that there's, it's not just that they're accusing him of being demon-possessed. There's a bit of racism going on here also. Uh, the Jewish people had a very low view of Samaritans. Uh, I don't want to try to unpack the whole history, but they were sort of like half Jewish in a sense. Uh, Samaria was a region to the north of Judea, and the people there had been taken into exile um, by the Assyrians and then allowed to return to the land, but there were a bunch of non-Jews who returned with them. And so for the Jewish people who had a very strong ethnic identity and whose religious identity was very tied up in their ethnic identity, the fact that ethnically the people there were only partly Jewish was something that they really didn't care for. And also the way that the people there practiced their faith, there were some significant differences between Judaism as we understand it now and the sort of Judaism that was practiced by the people of Samaria. So when they say, aren't you a Samaritan and also demon-possessed, they're, they're being racist, first of all. They're, aren't you this half-Jewish person who we shouldn't really be listening to at all? And also, aren't you possessed by a demon? And, and the accusation that Jesus is a Samaritan is just made up, but there's, almost, there's sort of a little bit of a reason for why they might think that, because most of his ministry has been taking place in Galilee, which is also north of Judea. It's a separate Roman state 
from the state of Judea. And so here's this prophet from the north, this miracle worker that they've heard of because word of what Jesus was doing in Galilee had spread. Most of them didn't have much direct experience with Jesus at all. They had heard these stories about this figure in Galilee who was doing miracles and preaching. And then Jesus comes to Jerusalem and here are these people living in the heart of Judaism. People who are living in this city that's always had a special place in the Jewish mind. People who see themselves very much as the purest Jews, the ones who are closest to God. And then Jesus comes along, this rabble rouser from the north, and is challenging them. And they don't necessarily respond super well. Aren't you a Samaritan and demon-possessed? And Jesus answers in verse 49, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Those are both true statements, but they also imply a fairly clear accusation, right? Jesus answers them truthfully, I'm honoring my father, and you are dishonoring me. Two separate true statements. But the implication there, the accusation that's underneath the surface of the text, is that you're dishonoring the father. I'm here to bring honor to my father, you're dishonoring me, and therefore you're dishonoring God. So Jesus is responding truthfully, but he's responding in a way that's very challenging to these listeners. And then he continues, yet I do not seek my own glory. Like I mentioned before, sort of the heart of this argument is who Jesus is. They want to know who this person thinks they are, that they can tell them what to do. And Jesus isn't quite answering that question, but he's starting to make bolder and bolder claims. He's referring to God as my father. And then he says, I don't seek my glory, but there is one who does. And he is the judge. So again, he's making this claim to have a special connection with God and also challenging them. Like, listen, I'm not going to stand here and tell you how great I am. I'm not going to stand here and glorify myself but there is someone who's trying to glorify me and you're working against that person, that God. And he is the one who judges. So again, it's this pushback. He's not really coming out and saying who he is, but he's challenging them and saying, listen, you're running afoul of my father who is trying to glorify me and who I'm trying to bring glory to. And then he makes this claim, Very truly I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that Jesus doesn't mean you won't experience physical death, but he's talking about the promise of eternal life. And and we know that those two things fit together in in a way that we will still experience physical death, but there is a spiritual eternity and a resurrection that we'll be reborn into. The Jews don't know that. They're just hearing, again, who do you think you are that you can make such a claim? And they say that comes out pretty quickly. Now we know that you have a demon in verse 52. Abraham died and so did the prophets, and yet you say whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? This isn't the first time they've talked about Abraham. And the part of the conversation we didn't read They say, they identify themselves, we are children of Abraham. And that was a big deal to them because, as I mentioned before, their ethnic identity was a big part of their religious identity. They were all descendants of Abraham, whom God had chosen. God had called out of the city of Ur and had this special relationship with that set into motion the rest of the Old Testament. And for them, that ethnic identity that went back to Abraham defined who they were as people and in their religious lives. And now they know, everyone knows Abraham reached the end of his life and died. And here's this new figure, this person from up north, this miracle worker, claiming that if you follow him, there will be no death, which clearly implies that he is in fact greater than Abraham. And so it's a challenge to their identity. It's a challenge to their ethnic and religious identity. And again, Jesus isn't coming out and saying who he is, but he is challenging them. He is pushing. He is saying, this is the authority that I have. And they're, in their mind, it's just confirming he must be demon-possessed. 
But they challenge him. They ask him, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? So now we have the question finally just stated out in the open. You're making all these claims about your authority. You're making all these claims about what you can do, about setting people free, about freeing not only from sin but from death. Who do you claim to be? And Jesus, in a move that must have been very frustrating for a crowd that clearly is already upset, doesn't give them a straight answer. They finally come out and ask the question that's been at the heart of this. And instead of answering it straight, Jesus says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. We're in the second half of verse 54 here. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. Jesus says, I can't tell you who I am because if I say it, you're not going to believe me. If I say it, it won't be true. There is a, a law in Jewish custom I think that's actually mentioned earlier in this chapter even. You can't prove something with only one witness. Under Jewish law, you needed at least two witnesses. And so if Jesus just says, this is who I am on his own, that is not sufficient testimony. And Jesus knows that. So rather than making this claim about who he is, that's not going to be listened to, he says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. He of whom you say, he is our God. So now Jesus is making another big claim. My father, the one that you call God, will glorify me. Jesus is saying, you will find out who I am because God is going to glorify me. God is going to show you who I am. And then, just to really dig into that wound a little bit, He says, though you do not know him, God, who you claim to worship, is going to show you who I am, even though you don't really know him. Again, Jesus is saying something that is true, but it's also something that's extremely challenging, and some might even say harsh. He continues, you don't know him, but I know him. If I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Jesus is really pushing now. And he's, again, making a bold claim about himself. He's saying, you don't know God. Now, many of these Jews would have been educated. Many of these Jews would have been familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. But Jesus isn't just talking about a knowledge like you've been taught, a knowledge like you've been heard. Jesus is talking about a knowledge that includes or depends upon intimacy, right? You can know who Barack Obama is. You can know who Donald Trump is. You don't know those people, right? Unless you have way more political sway than I am aware of. None of you has ever sat down, you know, to brunch with Barack and Michelle and had a nice chat about how the kids are doing. You know who they are, you know things about them, but you don't know them. And that's kind of at the heart of what Jesus is saying here. This isn't so much, it's at least partly a chastisement of their, of their religious expression. But more than that, it's a statement about how well Jesus knows the Father. You're aware of God, you've heard these lessons, you've heard the scriptures. I know the Father. I've lived in loving fellowship. I've lived as part of the triune God. I know the Father in a way that you don't. And if I said otherwise, I'd be a liar like you're a liar. And again, that's the, there, it's clear that there is conflict here, right? This is moved beyond discussion, and maybe we could rightly call it an argument, But Jesus is challenging the religion that they've known. He's challenging the way that people perceive him. He knows that they've heard of him. He knows that they've heard he's a teacher. They know, he knows that they've heard he's a miracle worker. And he's really pushing. And although he's not coming out and saying who he is, he's challenging in all these different claims that he makes about himself. He's challenging them to consider. He's laying the foundation for something. Where were we? I would be a liar like you were a liar. But I do know him, and I keep his word. In verse 56, he says, Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. He's saying, you're you're rejecting me now that I'm here. 
The difference between you and Abraham is that Abraham looked forward to the day that I would come. He saw it and rejoiced. Now we know that Abraham is dead, so Jesus either means that he's seen it from the spiritual realm or he means it in the, in the sense of faith. Abraham saw through faith that this day would come and rejoiced. However he means it, the Jews take it very literally. And in verse 57, they said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? So again, they're hearing through a specific set of understanding. And they take Jesus' statement very literally, have you met Abraham? You're not even 50. And then Jesus says this, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Now what's wrong with that sentence? I hear chuckling. Somebody say it out loud. The, yeah, the tense, the grammar's all off. If you wrote that sentence in school, your teacher would be very unpleased. That's not how tenses work. I'm glad, I'm glad unpleased got a couple of chuckles. <laughs> it shouldn't be before Abraham was, I was, right? Before Abraham was, I am. It's a very strange way to say that. And if it was a mistake, you would think that somebody would have fixed it along the way, right? The reality is it's not a mistake. Jesus is saying something very specific here that's easy for us to miss because of the difference in language or because we're less familiar with the Old Testament than Jesus and his listeners were. You all remember Moses, right? Big deal in the Old Testament. Shows up in a lot of Sunday school stories. One of them, one of the spectacular ones, there's a burning bush, right? And Moses goes, and he takes his shoes off, and he has this whole conversation with God through the burning bush. And towards the end of the conversation, he says, who should I say sent me? He asks God for God's name. Who should I say sent me? And God, sort of cryptically, says, I am that I am. And they, different translators will render that slightly differently, but some version of I am is what he says. And in Hebrew, it's kind of an awkward construct. That's why you see it translated as things like, I am, that I am, I am, and I will be. There's all different ways that people try to render it. In Greek, the way they translate it is ego a me. I am I. I am, I am. Somewhere, again, it's an awkward thing that's difficult to translate. But when Jesus gets to the end of the sentence, before Abraham was... I am. He uses that very same awkward Greek construct. And what he's doing there is applying the name of God to himself. Jesus is making a claim of divinity to these Jewish listeners. These Jewish listeners who are asking him who he is, these Jewish listeners who are pushing back and saying, you must have a demon because the things that you're claiming are outrageous. When he's finally pushed, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he, claim, he makes this claim of divinity, this claim to be God or to be one with God in some way. And if you're uncertain about my accuracy in explaining that, let's read the, the very last sentence. Verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him. That's not a light response, right? They've been kind of arguing. Jesus has been pushing but you don't jump right from we have different religious views to where's a stone, it's about to go down. <laughs> and this, this was also part of a custom, right? Stoning was a thing. Stoning was a method of execution. You would push somebody usually off a hill so they couldn't run, and then you would throw stones at them until they died. A method of execution. And the Jews at this point recognize the claim that Jesus has just made. And they're unwilling to accept it. And you know, when, when somebody makes a claim like that, there's only a few options, right? There's only a few options to how you can respond to that. And you've heard me mention this before once or twice during this sermon series, right? C.S. Lewis's Trilemma. I see a few heads nodding. Some of you remember what I'm talking about. C.S. Lewis sort of famously proposed that when Jesus makes a claim like this one, it only really leaves us with three options. Right? Either he's lying, he knows that he's not God and he's lying to people, 
or he's a lunatic who thinks that he's God and he isn't. Or he's the Lord. He is actually God, whatever that means. And it requires some unpacking, but he is right and true in what he says. Those are the only three ways we can really go with this. Jesus is specifically saying, I am God. I am that I am. Before there was Abraham, I am. That's who I am. You want to know who I am? That's who I am. And we're left to question, what do we do with this? Just like the Jews were. Jesus is making this enormous, bold claim. And we have to ask, what does that mean? Like the Jews, we can look back over the ministry leading up to that moment. Jesus was doing miracles. He was healing people, restoring sight to the blind, making the lame walk again. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children. He fed 4,000 men plus women and children. He sent his disciples out and gave them authority to heal people and cast out demons. First 12 and then 70. We look at the content of his messages about repentance and about the kingdom of heaven drawing near. And we look at the, the weight of all of that evidence and we have to ask ourselves, Jesus claimed to be God. What do we do with that? Do we think that he was a liar? A liar who could either do all those miracles or manage to dupe all of those people into thinking that he was somehow doing all of those miracles? Do we think that the New Testament is the largest conspiracy in human history to fool billions of people over thousands of years into believing Jesus was somebody that he wasn't? Or do we think that Jesus is a crazy person? That he believed that he was God, but he was wrong. And if he's a crazy person, how did he do all those miracles? Did he deceive people? Were there other people using this crazy person? Because if Jesus actually did all those miracles, if Jesus actually healed all those people, if Jesus actually taught these lessons that have been so meaningful for so many people, if Jesus is right and telling the truth about who he is, it requires from us a different response. Right? Oftentimes we like to think of Jesus only as a teacher. Because if Jesus is only a teacher, then the challenges that he makes are good advice, but we're free to do with them as we like. Sometimes we like to think of Jesus just as the miracle worker, because then we can turn Jesus into sort of a genie, right? Jesus is a good guy, and he's powerful, and when I'm in trouble, I can ask Jesus for help. But I don't need to worry so much about the other stuff. If Jesus is a crazy person, we shouldn't be reading any of this. You can toss your Bible out if that's what you think. But if Jesus really is who he says he is, if Jesus really is God, that his words should be treated with so much weight, the challenges that he makes to us, the way that he calls us to live, the way that he calls us to treat other people, has to be taken completely seriously. The promises that he makes about the rewards for choosing to follow, the promises he makes about our eternal destiny, we can take those with so much more confidence if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. This is the question at the heart of the gospel. Jesus came, he did miracles, and he taught. And he told us that he was God. And we killed him for it. And then three days later, he came back to life. And again, we're forced to question, if he's a crazy person, how did he do that? If he's a liar, how did he do that? But if he is God, if he is exactly who he says he is, how can we not listen to what he said? How can we not rejoice in the promises that he made? How can we not be challenged and be changed 
by the, the things that he calls us to do. Jesus forces us to come to a decision. Right? He could have left these things out. He could have left it to his followers to try to explain who he was. He didn't. And because he didn't, we have to make a decision. Do we trust? Do we believe? Or should we just close this book up and get rid of it? I hope that you won't close your Bible and get rid of it. In the reality, in these days, you, you know, you just call it up on your phone anytime you want. It almost doesn't really even matter if you have a paper one. But I think there is more than sufficient evidence that we should take Jesus at his word. But that's our challenge for today. Maybe you haven't given much consideration before to whether or not Jesus is the Lord, to whether or not he is God and what weight we should put on his word. But he challenges us to do that. He didn't shy away from it. He pushed. He pushed the religious people of his day to consider it, to weigh it, and to believe or not believe. And today we face that same challenge. Amen? The choir is going to come up and sing for us now. And if you'd like to worship through your giving while they do, we have plates available in the front here and in the back over there. If you're joining us online, as always, if you'd like to worship through your giving, we do have a donate button on our website, or you can mail checks to the church.
Please join me in our offertory prayer. God, our provider, in Christ you give us a spring of pure water that overflows to eternal life. Your love and hope fill our hearts, so we want to worship you in spirit and truth. Open our eyes to see the places where our church's ministries could reach new people. Direct our gifts and offerings for your purposes, so that our community will become like a field ripe for harvest. We ask this through Christ the Lord, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Our closing hymn is The King of Love My Shepherd Is, number 138 in the hymnal, and it's on the screens behind me. We have a special treat this morning. Our benediction will be sung. Amen. Have a good week. Remember, there's refreshments in Homer Hall, and Forum will start in here. Uh, Kathy, what time is the live stream set to start? I think it's 11. So you'll have a, a little while to get some refreshments and fellowship in Homer Hall, and then we'll be back in here to start Forum at 11 o'clock.